morning. It's always good to be with you. <clears throat> but I need you to pray for me because I, I could have gone to sleep on the pew. I took some of cough medicine. They said, don't drive. It may make you sleepy. <laughs> I thought, Lord, I got to drive a lot today. <laughs> I invite you to turn in your, the Gospel of Matthew to the second chapter. And let's hear a part of the Christmas story after Christmas that we often do not hear or talk about. But it's full of uh, instruction for us. This is after the Magi had gone to um, bow at the feet of Jesus and they rose and they went a different way. And we pick up the story, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I call my son. And when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Jerusalem in his vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Would you pray with me? Father, your word has instructions. Your word tells us about you. It tells us about life. It gives inspiration and direction. Lord, would you speak through this very weak person today? And may we grasp hold of some truth and some instruction that you mean for each one of us as we seek to mold our hearts in the ways of Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. I can still remember that very hot week in the middle of July as it were if it were yesterday. But it happened a long time ago. Matter of fact, it happened in 1965. It's one of those events that happen in your life that become a marker, and, and they're those events you have that you always remember. I, along with hundreds of others from the newly formed 1st Cavalry Division Air Mobile, was granted a brief four-day leave. Our unit was going to be located, relocated from Fort Benning, Georgia to some unknown destination. It, it was supposed to be a secret, but we knew. We read the newspaper. The conflict in Vietnam was worsening, and we knew it was Vietnam. For the previous eight weeks, we had been in very extensive and intensive training and while on leave, President Johnson announced that he was sending our division along with several other regiments to Vietnam. My leave was over and I left home with some anxiety. We tried to laugh, but humor was dried up within us. We tried to hope, but the unknown of the months ahead on the, to be spent on the other side of the world in the midst of war seemed so overwhelming. My parents tried to be reassuring, but I sensed and felt the agony they felt as they stood by to say goodbye to me, their youngest of four children going off to war. My mother tried to hold back her tears, but she was unable. The Christmas of that year was the first Christmas in my 19 years of living that I spent away from home and family. And I received uh, uh, 
a film in the mail that December, thankful to WTBD in Durham. Uh, they made five minute films of parents and friends who had loved ones in Vietnam. And I received the film and I finally found a, a projection booth where the film could be shown. And I sat in that little projection booth one night and home was brought to me. A few of my high school friends shared their greetings in a joking sort of way. And then there was my mother and father. And as they spoke, I sensed their anxiety. Tears swelled up in my mother's eyes. And the fear she must have felt. Her youngest son, a combat infantry soldier in an unknown place to her, and nightly she had caught glimpses of the horrors of war brought into her home through TV. Just two weeks before the film was made, the 7th Battalion in our division engaged several thousand North Vietnamese soldiers in a place called the Iron Drain Valley, and we had over 250 casualties. Surely she was thinking, would I come home alive? And as I walked back that evening, thinking of her tears, I thought, how many parents were weeping for their children? Children taken away by the harsh realities of war that was difficult for our country to understand. And as I recall that scene, so vividly etched in my mind, seeing my mother weep for me, I think of today's scripture reading of the image of Rachel weeping for her children. I mean, that's a powerful image, isn't it? Uh, a parent weeping for their children. What parent at one time or another has not wept for their children? Uh, I think of parents who see their children run away from home in hopes of finding a better life. I think of parents, even though their children may live at home, they're emotionally distant from their parents. I think of children who are held captive by forces of evil today, from those who are deceitful and dishonest to those who are on drugs, from children who steal and slander to those who are absorbed by alcohol, for those children who are involved in illicit sexual activity, to those who refuse to do their best work. I think of thousands of parents who, because of terror in this world, have fled their home countries in the Middle East and have lost their children by death or in flight, being separated and cannot find them. And oh, how they must weep for their children. I think back of the one-year-old, five-year-old, 12-year-old brother in Ubrin that was killed this past March, and how their mother must weep for them. I, I think about parents whose children are captivated by evil forces that attempt to get them to disrespect God, living as though he does not exist, that he does not make any difference in their lives, neglecting the church and all the things spiritual and worthwhile. I think about parents who weep for their children, and I weep with them. I think about the mother whose bed I sat beside in hospice two weeks ago, weeping for her oldest adoptive son, whose life of addiction and stealing had left a deep tear in her heart, feeling so Hopeless. When her husband died, he came to the family viewing but did not show up the next day for the funeral. Only to discover that he had stolen their credit cards and gone on a rampage of drugs again. And as she sat there dying, thought of how she must felt weeping for her children. As I think about that, I think that God weeps for his children. Have you ever think of God weeps for his children who suffer at the hands of others just like those children 
who were two years old and under in Bethlehem and vicinity, uh, when King Herod set loose his reign of terror after he found out about the birth of Jesus. I mean, you recall that scene, don't you? You, you know, the, we read about it. After his birth, the Magi, three men from the east, uh, came in, in Jerusalem and asked, Where is this one who is to be born, the king of the Jews? We saw a star in the east, and we have come to worship him. And the thought of a new king frightened Herod. Uh, such a possibility of someone undermining his authority and position came into his heart. So he secretly requested an audience with the Magi. He told them when they found the one who is to be born the king of the Jews to come and report it to him so that he too may go and worship them. And after the Magi found Jesus and presented their precious gifts to him, they were warned in a dream not to return to Jerusalem, and they went home another way. You remember also that Joseph was warned in a dream to flee to Egypt. And when Herod learned that he had been tricked by the wise men, in his anger he moved to remove the threat of a new king who might usurp his position. Herod concluded that he would have all the children, but boys, two years and under, in and around Bethlehem, slaughtered. According to Barclay, the, the population of Bethlehem was meant that maybe it would be 20 or 30 male babies, and maybe in the vicinity another 20 or 30. So maybe 40 and 60 male babies under two were slaughtered. A ruthless, brutal, and insensitive thing of an insecure king. But this was Herod's character. He was a master at the art of assassination. He had no sooner became to the throne that he, he began annihilating the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of the Jewish people. Later, he would slaughter 300 of his own court officials. And later, he murdered his wife, Marianne, and his mother, her mother, then Alexandra, the oldest son, Antipatha, and two other sons. His insecurity led him to do these brutal acts, and now he was murdering babies. Can you put your head around this kind of scene? Soldiers following orders, perhaps they did not understand, going into a home and ripping a baby away from a mother and either twisting their neck or stabbing them in front of the mother. Oh, the tears that must have been shed and the hearts that were broken, such a, a brutal, senseless thing. And Matthew, reporting this incident, quoted from the prophet of Jeremiah. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. This prophecy originally came from a time when the people of Jerusalem were being led into captivity and the captives were being led into an alien land. They passed through Ramah, a small town about five miles from Jerusalem. Uh, Ramah was the place where Rachel lay buried. And as they passed by, Jeremiah pictured the mother, Rachel, weeping for her people. Poetically, this scene pictures God's heart breaking and weeping for the nation of Israel and who, because of their indifference to him and their sin, were now being led into captivity, into exile, and who would some who would never return home again. As I studied this passage this week and the full context of the prophecy found in Jeremiah 31, I was moved in my spirit by several things that touched me. First, I saw a picture of God's heart through the message of Rachel weeping for children. It's really an actuality that God weeps for his children. I mean, have you ever thought about God weeping over sinful children? God hearts breaks and he weeps when we travel the road of sin and we experience the consequences of sin. I mean, that's the picture depicted here in Rachel 
weeping for God's people. And as a result of their sin and indifference to him, now they are being caught, carried off into exile, and we find God weeping over his children. Such is his love for us. God does not rejoice or take delight in sin. His heart breaks for sinful people. God cries over the hurt and pain brought about by sin. How do you feel when people get trapped or caught in sin and experience sin's aftermath? Do you take delight? Do you say, well, they're getting what they deserve? Or does your heart break? I'm reminded of the old story of a guy named Stan who was always on the hit list of revivalists who would come to a small town, and he was always invited to come to the services. He never made any decision for Christ, and finally, a very humble evangelist came to town, and of course, Stan was invited to come to the service. This time, after the altar call, Stan went forward and gave his heart to Christ. And when asked, why did he come this time and not the other time, Stan replied, other preachers, when they said that people who did not repent of their sins and accept Jesus Christ would go to hell, and they said it with a sense of anger in their voice, almost a sense of delight. When this man said it, he said, I would go to hell if I did not repent of my sins and receive Christ. He had tears in his eyes. Does the lostness and sinfulness of people break your heart and cause tears to come to your eyes? It does to God. And if it does to God, it ought to for you and me. Also, I see God weeping over the pain of children, especially when they suffer pain because of other people. God weeps for the pain of his children. He weeps of the plight of all the children in the world, especially those little children. You hear about the baby found in a church this week in New York City, weighed five pounds, left there by a mother who either could not take the care of the child or did not want the child. Oh, how God must weep. Around the world at this very moment, over a half billion people are starving to death. Some of them live right here. Most of them live in war-torn countries like Somalia and the Sudan and the Congo. And then there are those in the Middle East. Did you realize that over 51% of all refugees in the world are under the age of 18? Millions of people have fled to neighboring countries for their safety. Thousands upon thousands murdered and thousands and thousands of more are dying because of hunger or disease. Oh, how God must weep for his children. And what we see, he is a compassionate God. And this passage speaks about two roads we can take this Christmas season. Herod who gave lip service to wanting to bow down to Christ, chose to follow personal indifference and selfishness. I mean, his selfishness, his need for power, his refusal to change, his refusal to worship, his pretending to want to worship and not worship caused him to miss one of the greatest events that ever happened in human history. Herod chose the road of indifference, he was upset at the thought of coming uh, of a new king would alter his life. He didn't want to be changed. He wanted things his way and not God's way. And oh, how God must have wept. But did you notice that the Magi had another experience? Uh, they were focused on finding Christ, and when they did, they knelt at the cradle and they worshipped him, and when he, they got up, they went home a different way. And no doubt they were different people because they had knelt and given their gifts to Christ the child. And I think such is the case when Jesus is really the center of life, 
when we too offer our gifts and kneel before him in worship, and God's heart must have rejoiced at their acts. And it begs the question, well, what road will you take this Christmas? Will you be like Herod or the three magi? Will we find God weeping over you this Christmas? Will you be too busy to worship? Too preoccupied with focusing on yourself, buying gifts for your family that they really don't need? Or will you travel the road of the magi, making the giving of your gifts and the worship of Christ the central focus of the holiday season? I see something else in this scene. I see that we're reminded that we live in a world full of evil. As we think about man's inhumanity to man, uh, just like the tragic acts that Herod did that first Christmas, we, we still combat evil today. Evil is persistent. As those babies were willfully slaughtered because Herod didn't want any competition, what about the millions of babies who are willfully slaughtered in the womb because a mother doesn't want any inconvenience? We, we do live in a world of evil, don't we? And evil always seeks to destroy that which is good. And that's what Herod reminds us. We, we must remember that we live in a world we have to contend with and battle the forces of Satan and we should never forget that. But this scene also comes with hope and promise. Remember that God came to dwell in our midst. God's tears led him to action to do something about our sinfulness. And in the birth of Jesus, he came to offer hope, to give an answer, to offer a way out of sin and a road to life. See, God broke into an evil world to offer life. Through the birth of Jesus, he came to give us victory over the forces of Satan to let us know that all is not lost and all is not hopeless. You see, Jesus was the ultimate answer to the prophecy given in Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah writes, this is what the Lord says, restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded. They will return from the land of the enemy, so there is hope in your future. This first Christmas reminds us of a Christ that God will reward and give us a hope because he bothered to send himself in the flesh of a baby born in Bethlehem. In Jesus, God became Emmanuel. And just as he came to dwell on earth then, he comes today the gift of his Holy Spirit to dwell in people like you and me who are willing to kneel and offer our gifts to him and worship and rise to go home another way to bear witness to the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings I want to tell you about another Rachel who was nurtured by this congregation whose heart was challenged and changed when in college she was asked to pray for the Muslim people, a people who had wrapped their hearts around a false God, and who heard and understood God's tears for those people, and who has gone to live in a very dangerous area to bear witness to Jesus. In a recent newsletter last month. I want you to listen to what she wrote. One of the first book stories I learned as a child was the story of Abraham and Isaac, no doubt a story she learned here in this congregation. Many of us are familiar with the father's faithfulness to Sarah and Abraham and his provision of a son in their old age. We also know the account of the father calling Abraham to sacrifice Isaac on the mountain. Abraham followed the father's direction, trusting in his provision. He was obedient. He did not know the end result or if his beloved son would be saved, but he listened to the father because he knew he was good. 
And the Father did provide a sacrifice to place, take the place of Isaac. He provided a sheep and promised continued provision. This story is known to people in this part of the world as well, except Isaac is said to be Ishmael, and it is celebrated each year with a major holiday. Children are out of school, businesses are closed, and the roads are all but deserted. This day has the same feel that Christmas Day does in the States. In the weeks leading up to the holiday, instead of family choosing trees to decorate, families search for a sheep to be slaughtered. Throughout the city, outside grocery stores, on empty street corners, and along highways, Corrals of sheep are set up and families are meticulous in their selection. The sh sound of sheep blading can be heard from every yard and on the day of the festivities, the streets literally run with blood. As I walked through my neighborhood to the chorus of bleeding sheep and even attended a holiday meal at a friend's house, I was keenly aware and reminded that the father's provision for Abraham on the mountain was not the end of the story, not even close. Many years later, another sacrifice was provided, a pure and perfect sacrifice who took my place and your place on the sacrificial altar. His blood was shed once so that ours would never have to be shed. He defeated death so that we could be given life. It is because of that truth we can be like Abraham and walk in faithful obedience. And despite the circumstances in front of us, we can trust in the Father's ultimate vision and love. As the streets ran red with blood of the Lamb, my heart broke for those who do not know the story of the one who became a sacrifice on their behalf and waits eagerly for them to hear the name and receive the message. And today, Rachel is in that land with a desire to tell the story. What's happened to us? Do our hearts weep over the sinfulness and brokenness and the lostness of man. Does it bother us at all that two-thirds of people in this community have no heart whatsoever toward God? Have, have we somehow become so complacent We don't care if people go to hell. We can say it with our mouth, we care. But in our actions? I mean, who are we so broken for that we can just kneel at an altar and offer up a prayer for them? When's the last time you shed a tear over the brokenness and the sinfulness of a friend or a neighbor or a family member? When was the last time you even bothered to walk across the street to greet a person and tell them about Jesus? It, it seems to me if God's heart is broken, and the image of him weeping over sinfulness. And that doesn't tug at our hearts. We have lost something. Do you remember the day when this sanctuary was full of people worshiping God? Dr. Walter Harmon grew up in Bowie's Creek. He graduated from the University of North Carolina Medical School in 1925. He went to practice medicine as a pediatrician in New Jersey, and he chose, he retired first in, in Southern Pines, and then he came here to Bowie's Creek. But when he 
you've said something. He said, I remember the day in Bowie's Creek, the time a child reached 12 years of age and had not accepted Christ, it was a concern of the whole community. But what about now? I found myself weeping for myself this week. God, have I lost something? I found myself thanking God for people who cared enough to tell me about Jesus. Who prayed for me. Of a mother who prayed with, for me all my life, particularly though that year in South Vietnam. <coughs> how indifferent our prayers have become today. And yet there was one nurtured in this congregation whose heart grew toward a people she was challenged to pray for. Whose heart was so molded that she was willing to go to this dangerous place. It's all about the true sacrifice. a name to put on your heart to pray? Can you look at the people around you who are indifferent to Christ in your church? I assume people not attending church have no relationship with Jesus. I mean, how can this dynamic, powerful force come into your life and you not want to love him and worship him? that you begin asking God to help you to bear witness to him. Maybe this Christmas season ought to begin with our tears for those who are missing the real reason of the season and that we just bow before God and say, here I am, God, use me to share your word. Father, it's so easy to become comfortable because we consider ourselves in the in-group. It's so easy to become complacent. We forget about the mission to which you have entrusted to us, the joy which we have to share, the eternal hope which we have to offer through Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, this season that our heart may be massaged in, in, in such a way that, that, that we can have the same kind of compassion for, you, for people who are lost, caught in sinfulness. It's so easy to be indifferent. Lord, I'm grateful that you are not indifferent, that you chose to do something about our sinfulness. You made it possible for our sins to be washed away and for us to have life that really becomes life when we die. Thank you for that. So move us and direct us that our hearts may become more like yours. We ask this in Jesus. During the month of December, we do receive an offering for called the Lottie Moon Offering, named after a missionary.